Hi, you're listening to The Sociology Show, a podcast about absolutely anything to do with the wonderful world of sociology. Whether you're a teacher, a lecturer, a student, or just taking a passing interest, this podcast will look at a range of issues from social class, ethnicity, gender, sexuality, religion, crime, education, and anything else that sociology has to offer. My name is Matthew Wilkin, and each episode I will speak to someone working in the field of sociology and let them explain all about their own interests, their research, and their experiences. So, put your earphones in, turn the volume up, and let's be sociology geeks together, eh? Hello and welcome to The Sociology Show. This podcast is sponsored by Collins, High Quality Student Books, Teacher Guides and Unbeatable Value Revision for GCSE and A-Level Sociology. Now, Sociology Show listeners can get 25% off Collins Sociology resources until the end of December 2021, including the new book, How to Be a Sociologist, an inspiring introduction to studying sociology at A-Level and university. If you'd like to take up this offer, simply head to collins.co.uk forward slash sociology Sociology and enter the code Sociology Show at the checkout. Terms and conditions do apply. The Sociology Show is also brought to you in association with Tutor to You, the exam performance specialist for A level and GCSE sociology students and teachers. If you would like to look at what they've got, then do visit tutortoyou.net forward slash sociology, and there you can pick up revision guides, flashcards, revision videos, and everything else that you need for your A level or GCSE sociology studies. And so, my guest for this episode was Dr. Donna Peacock, who is a Principal Lecturer in Criminology and Sociology at the University of Sunderland. Really enjoyed this one. So without further ado, let's go over to the interview with Dr. Donna Peacock. Um, I always start, uh, Donna, by asking people to say a little bit about who they are and what they do, if you don't mind. Okay, so I'm Donna Peacock. I'm a team leader and principal lecturer at Sunderland University. Um, the team I lead is health and social care, criminology, sociology and policing. And we've got some postgraduate provision around um, criminal justice and inequality as well. Um, my background is I'm a criminologist and a sociologist. Um, and I've been doing some uh, research recently around vulnerability. Thank you. And some amazing things going on at University of Sunderland at the moment. Every time I look, you're up for a new award of some sort or other. <laughs> yes, um, I think we've been doing quite well with our um, widening participation agenda, making higher education more accessible for students from all different kinds of backgrounds. Um, and I think a shared concern across the university is around inequality and diversity as well. So, yes, we have been doing quite well with winning some awards lately, and we're very proud of that. That's great to hear. That's great to hear. And Donna, do you mind explaining a little bit about why you went into that field? You know, there's lots of different avenues you can take in sociology. What was it about the kind of crime and criminology area that really interested you? Yeah, the reason that I chose to study crime and criminology is um, it really came from an interest in sociology and the sociology of crime and deviance. So I studied um, sociology at A-level at Newcastle College back in 1995, and I had a really fabulous A-level sociology teacher who just made the subject really interesting and accessible. Um, And the crime and deviance module was just quite new. It was something I hadn't studied before at high school or anything like that, uh, and I just found it really interesting. So at the time I had applied to study sociology for my degree and uh, Northumbria University that year were just launching a new degree in um, criminology and uh, it was a a new discipline at the time, quite new um, and there weren't really very many courses up and down the country so uh, it was a really good opportunity to get involved in studying something new and I I studied joint on as sociology and criminology as my degree so I've always really been a sociologist and a criminologist by heart and I, and I see both really as, as interconnected disciplines. Um, particular interests around criminology though I think you know a lot of people do get involved in, in studying crime and criminology from an interest in some of the very kind of media um, sensationalist stuff that you see and that was very much me. When I was younger I enjoyed reading those you know the novels that you get around about crime and books about serial killers and documentaries and things like that. I just always found it a really fascinating area. So it being there as an academic discipline to study was just really interesting. And I thought a good opportunity. Yeah. Just thinking how big it is now, you know, if you, if you scan through Netflix or something like that, every other sort of series is something to do with crime or real life crime, isn't it? So it's, it's huge now. 
It is, and it's actually even um, taken off into an area of, of something that was studied as criminologists, you know, why, why society is so fascinating, um, fascinated with crime. And, and, you know, we've got games around crime, computer games, films, videos. It's almost like in some way we find it thrilling and interesting and we want to get near it. So it is something that criminologists study as a discipline now. Could we explore that a little bit more? I'm really interested because I myself, you know, I'm always fascinated in a new crime documentary or a new crime series or new detective story. And, and, th- and that's the same for many people, even if they are completely non-criminal themselves. There's this fascination with crime and deviance. Where, where do you think that comes from in our kind of human psyche? Um, well, the way cultural criminology explains it is, though, is as though there's a cycle between culture and crime. So crime informs culture. Crime becomes embedded in culture. But culture, the, the nature of the culture creates crime as well. So um, that, that sounds quite abstract. To give you a little bit of an example, what might happen is you might get a really um, major um, criminal event. So um, Ed Gein in America was a well-known serial killer. And we've seen his crimes portrayed or um, sort of similar versions of similar types of crime in films like Hannibal, um, recently in American horror stories. Just, I think, what what it does is it takes a real event and there'll be some media portrayal of it, but then it, it can end up where, for example, you have people making Halloween costumes, um, people reading about things, people writing articles. So it's almost like you can have a crime and then a representation of the crime um, and then a representation of the representation. So it's sort of... Um, but it, something that's a criminal event can come quite deeply embedded in culture. But once something's there in culture and it's in things like films or media, you then get people p- potentially copying um, or getting ideas about how to commit crimes. So, yeah, it is quite an interesting area of study. Yeah, I've just been I just finished watching um, the Ted Bundy tapes. And I mean, he was basically a, a celebrity at the time you know and the number of people cramming into the court just to, to get a look at him and it's it's really fascinating that kind of area why why we have this fascination or obsession with serial killers but any type of criminality actually well with my students there's a there's a case example that we'll look at that was a um a crime that happened in france where there was a, a it was a, a murder um and there was cannibalism as part of the afterwards after the crime so the 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 person had kidnapped a young lady um had eaten parts of her body and then other parts of the body had ended up being put in a suitcase and dropped in a lake um and the person obviously was um arrested and you can imagine the the public outcry at the time um he was actually taken back to japan and it was decided that he the reason he had committed the crime was to do with a, a mental health condition that he had and that he no longer was suffering from the particular mental health condition that had affected him when the crime was committed so he was actually released back out in the, in the japanese society oh, wow. um and the reason it's quite an interesting case study to look at is i mean that's a really it's a very disturbing and horrific crime um he's a major celebrity and some of what he's been involved in since has been things like um there was a show filmed where there was young models who w- went to like a reality tv show mm. went and lived with him in his flat for a weekend and it was all filmed for a, for a tv um a cooking show which was particularly disturbing um <laughs> he's been involved in writing novels and you know graphic cartoons and things like that so it just shows the kind of level to which we're actually as a society fascinated by um, the kind of the celebrity elements of these very serious and sensational crimes. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, yeah, that's taken me back a, lot, a little bit, especially the cooking program thing. That's really, yeah, I'm not it's sure what to make of that. Isn't it? <laughs> um, bring, bring it a little bit more back to your kind of interest. You mentioned cybercrime, policing, vulnerability, are kind of your, your areas of expertise. Um, what should we start with, Donna? Which one should we uh, have a look at there? Um, should we do cybercrime first? Because I think that was what I came across first. And then we'll, I'll talk you through a little bit, maybe how I ended up straying into the other areas, which was almost by accident, as right. can tend to happen. Um, cybercrime was my study that I did for my doctorate. Um, and to be honest, it came around from a gap that I identified when I was doing some teaching at uh, Northumbria University on a course called Computers and Crime. Um, And what I was finding was when you look at profiles of computer hackers, they were all very young. And I was thinking, you know, with your sociological mind as you do, 
So what happens when they get older? Are they like stopping doing it for some reason? And if they are stopping doing it, why might that happen? So I'd kind of come, you know, I'd come to this idea in my own head that maybe they were getting to a point where they had families, they had children, they had partners. So there was maybe a little bit more to lose in terms of them committing crime. If you, you know, if you ended up being sent to jail, like you could lose your family or lose your job. Um, if they were more sort of settled and established when they were older in their own lives. So I was thinking of, around it in kind of a rational rational choice kind of way. And when I actually started studying it, I found that that was part of the reason, but not necessarily the full story. So what, what I did was I was looking to see why people who are computer hackers who do that legally as part of their job why they choose to do that via that legal route rather than doing it illegally. So, you know, you could be you could be hacking in your bedroom into some major organization just in your own time and that's a crime. Or you could be doing the exact same activity, but you've been employed by someone to do it. And the literally the only difference is that one has permission and the other doesn't, and it's the same event, it's the same activity. So I was quite interested in sort of unpicking why they were making that particular choice when I'd got around this you know like I say I'd started with this idea around rational choice and I was thinking why are they making the certain choices that they're choosing and what was it that happened when they were older because what was happening was people who had been involved in illegal activities when they were younger were carrying on the same activity but actually they were being co-opted into big you know, organisations that were going to work for cyber security firms, they were going to work for software companies. So they're doing the same activity, but what's changed is they've gone from doing it in an illegitimate way to a legitimate way. So that was really quite interesting. So I did a series of interviews with people working in cyber security and talked to them about why they were making those choices about ethics and the law. Um, and what I found was there was really two roots into it. So you had people who had gone into working in cyber security via the route that I had expected. You know, they had been hackers first. They'd been very much part of that hacker underground um, kind of community and had been involved in that. And they had just changed towards doing it legitimately. But what I hadn't expected, and this is the beauty of doing research, is there was a whole other set of people that I had not expected to find who had a whole different career trajectory. So you had a bunch of people who had worked in um, law, in policing, in security, and they had trained as cyber security experts after being trained in their law and cyber security roles. And what was really interesting was with these two completely different sets of people that they actually had quite different ideas about ethics and the law and what was appropriate or inappropriate behavior. So that was quite interesting to find. Um, people who had been part of the hacker underground first were a little bit more flexible in terms of what they saw as right and wrong or legal and illegal. Um, and they would make decisions based really on what they saw as the outcomes of, of an event, um, whether they were doing harm to somebody. So for example, I had one guy explain to me that he didn't really see any harm in you know illegally downloading films because you weren't hurting anybody. So there's yeah. no harm. What, why, what's wrong with that? Where somebody from a policing or a security background would say, no, the law's the law, it's black and white, you have to follow the law, and it's wrong because the law tells you it's wrong. So that the two groups of people had quite different mindsets because of the way they'd been socialised in the communities that they came into the role from. So that was, that was quite an interesting project. That's, that is interesting. And was the main sort of incentive of the illegitimate cybercrime, um, was, was it financial? Is there, was there a lot more to be made in that route rather than taking the, the legal route, if you like? Um, I think potentially there is more money to be made if you adopt the illegal route. I think there's more money, but there's obviously more risk and there's more to lose as well. So for somebody who's weighing up those benefits against the limitations, um, it might be that they're going to make a choice to, to go the legal route. Um, I think what has happened, though, is in terms of the illegal side of it, because of changes in technology and um, more accessibility of software, it's meant that there's been a change in what can actually be made. So I was talking to one guy about um, a computer card breach that he had been involved in. And what he actually said to me was that if 
there's been a breach at a bank, for example, and he's the cybersecurity expert who's been called in, that potentially, let's say, 5,000, 7,000 credit card numbers have been stolen. If he's called in as the expert, he could then go ahead and steal more mm. and then close the breach and nobody would know it was him because potentially it would look like it was part of the original breach that had taken place. Yeah. So what he was saying was, as a cybersecurity expert, it would be really, really easy to do but he said it wasn't actually worthwhile doing because what he was telling me was that a credit card number with a full identity with it so that you could use the credit card on the dark net, they only sell for about two pound each, which wow. I was quite startled to find that, that that's actually the value of yeah, you know, your personal information and somebody being able to access that. Um, and he said, it's just not worthwhile doing. He said, you know, if I, if I actually wanted to do it, I could go in, I could go and get that at any point I wanted. So for me, there's not much point in me, stealing that when it's accessible it was from the employer it's not it's not something that would be worthwhile doing yeah it was quite yeah. interesting ethically because you can imagine we're getting really near to some you know potentially talking yeah. about criminal activity that people could or couldn't be involved in so yeah it was it was interesting to, to look at that um i think really just to be clear I, I did have to make a very clear warning to the people i was interviewing that if they gave any particular dates or specifics or times or companies that a crime had been committed against that i couldn't offer them confidentiality in that case and on the, in that respect, you know, the people that said it's not worth it, are, are the punishments for cybercrime, are they, are they particularly high or low? I have no idea in terms of what the, the punishments are like for such crimes. Um, the punishments, I mean, they'll depend on the, on the severity of what you do, obviously. The, the, up until 1990, there wasn't really a law against it. So the Computer Misuse Act came in in, in the UK in 1990, um, and it was copied off some American legislation that came out during the 1980s. Um, I mean, 1990 was really the beginnings of the internet sort of starting to become a big thing, wasn't it? Um, so I think the problem with that legislation when it first came in was it was designed for computer security, when actually a lot of the crimes and concerns that we see now are more around network security. So you can, you can breach a network or you can attack a network. And, and the law at the time wasn't really designed for that. So there have been some later updates to it. Um, for very serious offences, yeah, that I mean, you can get up to 10 years mm. as, a, as a sentence. But quite often there might be other offences that are connected to it. So it might not just be a computer misuse offence. There might also be, for example, offences around dissemination of child pornography, offences that are related to fraud or theft. Um, I think I think there was issues in the early early days before the computer misuse act was there because people were trying to use traditional fraud and theft legislation which didn't really always apply to things that might happen on the internet yeah so if i can give you an example um if i if i want to steal something from you that's an obvious theft a theft is taken without the owner's consent something that's their possession with the intention of permanently depriving the owner of that possession so i need to come and take something off you with the intention that you're not going to own that again um where if i break into your computer and i copy your files and i've taken a copy i've also left you a copy so i haven't actually deprived you of anything so right. you start seeing where there was difficulty around some of the very you know the old traditional laws and why there needed to be that change there Carl, oh, that's really complex isn't it really complex stuff <laughs> The Sociology Show podcast relies on the kind contributions of sponsorship and donations. If you enjoy the show, then you can help with the hosting costs by donating as little as £5 on the GoFundMe page. Simply visit uk.gofundme.com and search for The Sociology Show. If you can donate, then you will be sent a Sociology Show pen as a small thank you for your continued support of the show. And then where did you go in your next direction? So after doing the cybercrime stuff, where, where should we go next? Well, the next, I mean, things lead, one, one set of questions leads you into another set of questions, doesn't it, in sociology? Yeah. So one of the things was that when I was doing that particular study and I was contacting cybersecurity firms to look to talk to people, most of them were male. Hmm. Um, I couldn't find any females to speak to. Um, out of the 23 respondents who were involved in the study, only one was female. Um, so I was just quite interested in why, why it was that women weren't getting involved in this work. So uh, along with a colleague of mine at Sunderland University, 
uh, who teaches on a, a cyber crime and ethical hacking degree, because um, we'd had this conversation for quite a while, he was finding that most of the students that they were getting were also male. So we were sort of going, well, why is this? What's happening in the industry? So we followed it up with a survey that was sent out to cyber security professionals that was around gender, and it was around sort of roots into cyber security work. Um, were interested in whether people were being encouraged to get involved in this work, um, whether there was family support, whether there was careers guidance and mentoring, and also what was happening inside the industry. Because the other thing that happens is when females do seem to go into cyber security, they don't tend to stay as long in the industry and they'll, t they'll tend to move on into other roles more frequently. So we just really wanted to look at those differences and just see what the, what the barriers were. Um, one of the things for me that came out of this, the survey was that actually cyber security work, people who do it, find it interesting, it's challenging, they're learning all the time, there's really good pay, there's really good opportunities for promotion, um, but then for some reason uh, women and girls are seeing it as something that's not for them. So it was quite interesting, I mean... Um, we talk about STEM identities, you know, yeah. science, technology, yeah. engineering, and mass identities. And identities that tend towards being interested in STEM subjects are actually embedded, according to a lot of the research, by the age of about 10. So already it's seen as something where there's a difference in what girls and boys go into. And what we actually found here was a, a kind of a compounding risk because policing and security are also coded quite male. Yeah. So, do you know, it, it, the, the number sort of reduced again. So, yeah, it was re it's only, I mean, when we did that study, it was only about 11% of the industry were actually female. So for a career that's, especially with a skills shortage and rising cybercrime and, you know, the kinds of massive concerns that we've got about the big significant cybercrime events that we're seeing, that, you know, you, you could breach that, you could, you could fill the, the skills shortage if we could just get people interested in the survey, in the in the um, field of study sorry but I think what you'd have to do is go right back to what's happening in very early socialization in primary yeah. school and in, in families yeah it's 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 much broader than that isn't it and you just mentioned for example policing still huge underrepresentation of women within police force as well was that something that you looked at in relation to policing only really in the literature review because yeah. the because because there wasn't very much research in this area. So um, in constructing the kind of context that you do for a literature review for a study, we did look at differences in STEM generally, in cyber security, what was known about it, and across policing and security, and used that to inform the kind of questions that we were asking in the study. Thank you, thank you. Should we move on to a, a different area? Are you happy to move on, Donna? Well, yes, I think, I mean, I think for me, that probably leads nicely into the work around policing, which, yeah. which wasn't naturally something that was my area of interest. Um, in all honesty, what happened was my colleague was off on maternity leave and I was contacted by a local um, neighbourhood police officer from Biker Police Station um, who said, Donna, we're looking for some student volunteers. Do you think you could maybe help us with this project? And my colleague who teaches policing and studies policing more generally, as I say, was off on maternity leave. So I thought, well, I'll, I'll see what he wants and see if we can get something set up because I think we're always very keen on getting opportunities for the students to get involved in volunteering or in work experience, internships, anything like that. Because graduates who leave with some very practical experience are much more likely to get employed. So any any students working in the field, I would, you know, I would encourage to try and get some practical experience before you, you graduate. Um, and it's good to start looking at that during A level and during your degree. So I thought great, fantastic opportunity to just set a you know a new a new opportunity up for them. Let's go and find out what it is. Um, um, and what he said was there was a, a particular problem where they were struggling to get appropriate adults to work with vulnerable people who were brought into police custody um, across the Northumbria uh, region. So he asked if that was something that we might be able to consider helping with. And do you want to say a little bit more about that? Because I think that's an incredible thing for, for young people to be involved in. Um, I can imagine that it's quite demanding and quite emotionally demanding as well. But what an incredible thing to do. 
Well, yeah, it is. And I think it's really been a great opportunity for the students. They've learned so much. Um, but also, I think we're now at the point where we're providing a, a really good service to vulnerable people across the region as well. And it's a service that wasn't previously available to them. So um, probably would be be helpful for listeners if I, if I um, gave you a little bit of background about what the roles are. Please, yeah. um, an appropriate adult is somebody who would, during the time that somebody is detained in police custody or in contact with the police as a suspect, an appropriate adult would be um, there to support that person during that time. Um, so this was a, a role that was brought in by the Police and Criminal Evidence Act of 1984. Um, and it was really in response to a, a particular case where there had been a vulnerable, a, a vulnerable adult who had um, not been supported by an appropriate adult and this had gone to court um, and it had been found that that virtually admitted, made admissions to a crime that they hadn't committed and it was thought that that was due to uh, their vulnerability being exploited by the police. So this led to a series of procedures and investigations and and the Police and Criminal Evidence Act resulted. So uh, an appropriate adult, um, that what their role is, is from the point when somebody first arrives in police custody, you know, when they're being checked in at the desk, when they're having their rights and entitlements read to them, um, the person should be there to make sure that they understand those procedures right the way through any evidence gathering procedures. So during interviews, during uh, samples being taken, anything like that right up to the point of what we call disposal, which is where the person's given the outcome of the time in custody. So it might be that they're told no further actions taken. It might be that they're being told they're going to court. But it's basically during the entire period that they're in police custody. So the, the role is uh, to support vulnerable adults in particular. Now, what was interesting about this was that um, for young people, local authorities do have a responsibility under the Crime and Disorder Act from 1998 to support young people who are in contact with the police, you know, in, in police custody. So usually someone from a youth offending team or from the local authority would be sent along to go and support that person where there was a little bit of a, a strange legal situation for, for vulnerable adults where the police under... Um, the codes of practice for the Police and Criminal Evidence Act, they had to get an appropriate adult, but actually there wasn't anybody who was obliged to provide someone. Yeah. So you can imagine the difficulty from the police point of view there, if they've got a suspect who they suspect of having a learning disability, a specific learning difficulty, a mental health condition, something that might make them vulnerable during uh, evidence gathering, that actually they need to get an appropriate adult but then nobody has to supply that. So it just has ended up across the country where in every different region, it seems to be being delivered in different ways. So some regions use volunteers, some have private paid companies, some are funded through police and crime commissioners, some are done through charities. It's just been a bit of a hodgepodge of people trying to respond to, you know, providing some support in their area. So you know, I think our scheme um, was at the time unique in, in that we, we did this via the university with students. Yeah. And since then, uh, Humberside Police and Hull University have set up a similar arrangement. So that, that was that was nice to see that the scheme there took off really well as well. Yeah, that's amazing to hear. That's amazing to hear. And the, the vulnerable people themselves, I'm just really interested if you had some sort of commonality. Uh, do you hear similar stories in terms of how that person's arrived at that point in their life? Um, I mean, the, the kinds of offences that people have um, been suspected of to be brought in have ranged from everything, from what we would call volume crime, you know, like minor crimes, shoplifting, petty thefts, those kind of things, right up to quite serious offences, terrorist offences, homicides, sexual offences. So in terms of that, there's been a real range. Um, in terms of the people that we see ourselves support, supporting, I think probably in line with the, the general populations that we see coming through custody, they're very much uh, predominantly male, yeah. um, predominantly younger males. And I think also from what I've seen, predominantly from um, more deprived socioeconomic backgrounds as well. Um, and really, I mean, it's, it's worth investigating why that might happen. I've, I've got a, a theory personally that maybe is what's happening is people who have vulnerabilities who might be from more affluent backgrounds or maybe being better supported 
um, in school, in their in their you know general um, in their general upbringing, um, because there's more services, there's more resources available to them. You know, for example, somebody with a learning disability or a learning difficulty yeah. might have better access to maybe smaller class sizes through private education, private tutor and things like that. So they're probably more likely to achieve in their in their education. And um, that might mean that they're less likely to be involved in um, being involved in criminality. The other thing is kind of social influence. And I think what I've seen is that quite often vulnerable people can be influenced by organised crime. I know, you know, county lines and cuckoo yes. and have become much more predominant problems and we're much more aware of those now. But I've, I've actually been involved in um, supporting people where you've had somebody who has had people take over their house and use it for storing drugs, um, use it for as, as a base for dealing, um, organised crime, and that that person has not necessarily been involved in those activities, but they just want their friends to come around and visit. So I think sometimes it might just be down to particular, you know, postcode areas that people yes. live in and having vulnerable people who are actually being exploited by, by organised crime. And uh, my students are studying this at the moment, actually, about to do with gender and crime. And it, it, it's something that we can't ignore. You just mentioned predominantly male. Uh, what, what's your take on it, Donna? Why, why are crimes predominantly male, particularly at a younger age? I don't know. I guess there could be a lot of reasons. I mean, you could, you could go into psychological reasons. You could go into socialisation. I think I know there's, I mean, there generally has been a rise in female crime, hasn't yeah. there? I don't know. It's probably a, it's probably a difficult question to answer. Yeah, it's, um, I think it's so broad, isn't it? And it's, it's, you you yeah. can't pin it down to one reason, really. But There's going to be social influences. There's yeah. going to be family influences. There's going to be education influences. And, and I think sometimes just down to the opportunities that people are presented with. I mean, one of the, the key theories is down to socialisation, isn't it? That, that tends to be that girls are expected to be more caring, more quiet, more nurturing, and that boys are more extrovert, more boisterous, more, you know, adventurous. And so, you know, there has been suggestions that it's to do with the way people are socialised. But generally, I think there's something around opportunity as well. Mm. And um, some sociologists and criminologists have described women being more what's called constrained in the private sphere. So they're more likely to be at home. Yeah. Um, I know in um, in the A level syllabus to talk about bedroom culture. Yeah. You know where, where yeah. girls are more likely to see their friends and be indoors, and and boys are more likely to be out. So actually, it might just be about visibility that the kinds of things that boys are doing, particularly you know teenage boys and young men in their early twenties, it, it's about the fact that a lot of it's to do with drinking, is to do with it being crime that's on the streets, and it's just more visible and is more more picked up. So it's, it is very complex. I don't think you could pin it down to any one particular reason. It's probably, you know, a, a compounding of all of those issues, isn't it? Agreed. Agreed. Thank you, Donna. Thank you. Um, was there any other area that you wanted to, to talk about? I don't know if you wanted to say a little bit more about uh, some of your schemes and so on, if, if people want to get involved. Um, I think for, for our particular appropriate adult scheme, um, the way we run it is from the university. So it's only actually open at the moment to our internal students. Yeah. Um, so we'll have it staffed by health and social care students, students from criminology, students from sociology. Um, and I mean, it just makes it really nice and easy for us to organise and to run because they're students that we know personally and we can support and work with them. Um, I think probably the other thing to just talk about is some of the other questions it's opened and some of the research it's led to. Yeah. Because I think, um, you know, like I say, as, as a sociologist, you look at anything and it starts opening questions for you. And I think one of the key things that was interesting to me was um, some interest around the kind of language that's being used. You know, we're talking about appropriate adults and we're talking about vulnerable adults. And I really started questioning what some of that means when you start using the language. And that that really happened the first time I went out to a police station myself. Because I was training these volunteers and working with the volunteers, I wanted to have a good understanding of what it was that they were doing. So I, I did start actually doing quite a bit of volunteering myself. So the very first time I went out and I went, I'd went out to support somebody, 
And I've turned up at the police station and, you know, you go to introduce yourself. And I had said, oh, hello, I'm, I'm Donna. I'm here to be your appropriate adult. And as I heard myself saying it, I was thinking, actually, what does that mean when you say that to somebody? If I'm saying I, I am here to be your appropriate adult, I'm making the inference that they're not appropriate to yeah. be an adult for themselves. And actually, I'm speaking to a grown man here. And I just thought, actually, we need to, we need to question what's happened there. Um, so I... I'd, I, what I would do now if I go out and I'm introducing myself in, in that way, I would say, hello, I'm, I'm here from the appropriate adult scheme. Appropriate adult is the terminology that's used in law. It's the terminology the police use. It's the terminology that's used by services and support services. So you can't just decide to call it something different without changing the whole field, if you see what I mean. But I think really we need to start asking those questions. Um, so that, that was a concern. The other thing that was quite interesting to me was this idea of vulnerability. And you start thinking about what does it mean to be vulnerable and what does it mean to the person? And once I label somebody as vulnerable, what actually impact does that have? Because if somebody's come came into contact with the police that they're already going through a process of being criminalized, you know, labeled as a labeled as an offender, they've been caught doing something and that process is going on. So there's already, you know, an attachment of like something that might change your identity and change the way you see you, the, yourself. So I was thinking about this like layering on another label and saying actually you're not just an offender, you're, you're vulnerable as well and what, what that might mean for a person. And I think it's it's two-sided, it's a little bit conflicting. So if you are identified as being vulnerable, that can be a really positive thing in some ways. Mm. So it can attract resources, it can attract finance, it can attract support. So it can be to your benefit. And having, having you know, procedures and policies around vulnerability does mean that support's put in place and resources are there and available. But also, if somebody's labelled as vulnerable, that person might never have seen themselves as vulnerable before. So that might be something that they see as, as a negative label and they might start seeing themselves in like a deficit kind yes. of way. Like something's missing. I'm not, I'm not able to fully act or advocate for myself. So I just thought that was quite interesting, that label of vulnerability. And when you look into the, the literature around disability studies in particular, it's very much a label that's rejected because actually for some people, it's the situation that makes them vulnerable or it's the structures in society that might make somebody vulnerable. And by identifying the person as vulnerable, yeah, you're situating that responsibility with them. In, in quite a deficit way. So like I say, a bit of conflict about is this a good thing because it's attracting resource or is it a negative thing where you're taking away people's right to advocate for themselves or their sense of positive self-worth? So yeah. it just it was quite interesting to think about those labelling processes that were going on. Yeah, I was just thinking about sort of labelling theory, self-fulfilling prophecies. That all comes into that idea, doesn't it? Yeah, it does. And I mean, obviously, if we're, if we're thinking about label and theory, labels we know as sociologists, the, the impact on people in different ways. So you can see a label and you can very much internalise and act on a label and it, it become embedded as part of your personality. Or conversely, people sometimes really reject labels and say, that's not me. And they'll, they'll tend to act out exactly the opposite. Um, and, you know, we do have people who actually don't want to be supported by an appropriate adult. They so don't see themselves as vulnerable. They don't see themselves as yeah. in need of that support even though the law might identify that they need that in terms of research it's it's led because it, it opened up some questions it's led to, to some studies that we've done um first of all just at a local level where we're evaluating the scheme did the scheme work what kind of service were we providing you know we wanted to make sure that um the the service users were getting what they needed that the volunteers were getting something out of it that the police were actually finding that the, the service was covered properly so we started off with some early evaluation work and what was quite interesting with our scheme and nationally there doesn't seem to be a lot of service user voice in um provision of appropriate adult schemes so we conducted a, a survey with the support of the national appropriate adult network um where we contacted all of the schemes up and down the country um many of them are, are members of the national appropriate adult network and others that aren't affiliated were just contacted through the internet were, were asked them to fill in this survey that was about the level at which vulnerable people are actually involved in the service. In disability studies, there's a very well now established principle that um, 
disabled people's voices should be embedded in anything that affects mm. them. So, you know, if you're providing a service, you need to speak to people and find out about their lives and their experience and provide a service that suits their needs and not have people who don't have those experience decide on what's needed. And I just think that's quite a, it's a, it's a very well established principle elsewhere, but it doesn't seem to have followed through to where, um, you have disabled people who come into contact with the criminal justice system and many of the vulnerable people who appropriate adults see do have um, either physical disabilities or um, learning disabilities or specific learning difficulties. So, I, I mean, that was quite an interesting area to just start having a, a little bit of a look at. And what we found was that up and down the country, most of the services don't involve the people who are the vulnerable adults who are the service users of the schemes in providing the service, in designing the service, in training. Um, most didn't actually even have like evaluative processes where they would have a complaints procedure. And actually really you can you can see why not if you if you sort of look at the way the scheme runs. When you go into contact with a vulnerable person, you're doing that inside police custody. So you've got somebody who's already been identified as yeah. vulnerable at a time when they're particularly vulnerable because it's a really difficult, stressful situation. They've been accused of an offence. They're in a potentially unfamiliar environment. Um, police custody isn't the nicest environment to be in in any case, you know, you can imagine. So it, it just actually is difficult then to say, right, we're going to start conducting research in that environment with this particular research population or even just evaluations you know how do you follow up with a with a survey or an evaluation so it just was difficult what the schemes have been identifying is that they would like to to listen to what the vulnerable uh, adults want and need and would like to involve them but they're struggling for resources yeah. they don't have the time they don't have the money they don't know how to do it so I think the will's there, it sort of bodes well for the future that people want to do it. And, you know, there was some really good examples of really good practice where a few schemes had had managed to do it. And I think really what's needed now is to work out what's working up and down the country and get the good practice and get that shared so we can hopefully maybe get service users a little bit more involved. Um, so that came just directly from the running of the scheme. And, you know, us seeing for our scheme, what, what potentially we could improve as well. So I think that's at a national level. Um, the, mo the most recent project I've done has been a little bit of a move on from that, but it's, it's an offshoot from it, really. From working within that environment, I was put into contact with a lady who works for Liaison and Diversion in the Northumbria Police Region. And I was very interested to find um, she's an advanced speech and language therapist. Um, she's actually the only full-time speech and language therapist who's embedded fully in a police station in the entire country. Um, and what her role is, is she does assessments. If somebody's identified as vulnerable when they're in contact with the police, they're, they're also referred to um, a service called Liaison and Diversion. Um, the role of Liaison and Diversion is to try and hopefully reduce offending, reduce re-offending, support vulnerable people, um, but also to, to, where possible, divert them from the the justice system so they have pathways for for example for women who've been involved in domestic abuse and then commit offenses as a result um for previous veterans who are at particular risk of committing offenses um and you know the, the look at a range of different types of vulnerabilities so her role is where there's a suspected speech or language communication need that she would conduct a screening assessment um, and then might refer the person for additional support if, if that was needed. Now you can imagine if you've got a difficulty in speech or language or communication, if you've got a need in that area, actually police custody is an area where you need to be able to uh, communicate effectively. Mm. So there's a lot of having to you know, explain what's happened. You might have to give a narrative of an event that you've been involved in. You'll be asked about potentially an offence you've witnessed or been involved in. Um, there's lots of jargon. There's there's uh, rights and entitlements being read there. Even the police caution is quite, you know, complex for, for somebody to understand. So I just think that the language requirements and the, and the communication requirements in custody are quite complex. 
So somebody who can't actually communicate effectively is at a real disadvantage in that justice setting. Um, and, you know, it's around about 80% of people who are in prisons actually have a speech language or communication need which is, you know, that's that's particularly high. So it's about identifying those people as they come into police custody and providing the support that they need. So what she's been doing is just collecting lots of information and data about the people that she's been working with. So we've done a recent project that's just been analysing and looking at some of the patterns that we're seeing coming through in that data. So it's around one in five people who are coming into police custody who are finding have got a speech language communication need. Um, and quite interestingly, um, the majority of them didn't actually have a prior diagnosis of any kind that would indicate there was a speech language or communication need. So you can imagine if somebody comes into police custody and they identify themselves as having um, ADHD or an autism um, spectrum disorder or dyslexia, something like that, that, that might alert the police um, custody sergeant that some support might be needed. Um, but if they haven't got any prior diagnosis and the person doesn't identify the need themselves, there's no reason why the support would be put in place. So that the, the level of need is actually quite high. Um, the other interesting thing that came from it is there's a lot of literature around young people and speech language communication needs. Um, and there was a lot of um, people in the sample that we looked at that were adults who had no previously identified support needs. So you can see the, the difficulty if you've got adults who've got no prior diagnosis and there's nothing to indicate they need support, then liaison and diversion wouldn't be called. An appropriate adult wouldn't be called if needed. And then you've got people who are at a disadvantage going into trying to negotiate really complex procedures through police custody, but also, you know, through courts, through probation, through through prisons, through the entire justice system. So that's been the most recent project that we've been working on. Well, I'm, fu I'm full of admiration, full of admiration, Donna. That's amazing. And um, could I could I ask you uh, before we finish off, actually, because there'd be a lot of people listening who think thinking maybe they want to go to University of Sunderland or at least find out more about some of the schemes. Could you give out some more details of, for yourself? I know you're on Twitter, for example. Are you happy for me to give it out? Yeah, <laughs> it's it's at Donna Peacock Seven. If people are, if you're happy for me to give that out for people, um, thank you. If I, anybody wanted to email, I'm Donna Peacock at Sunderland AC UK, and I normally respond to emails quite quickly. I'm always happy to have a chat about any of our courses or any of our volunteering schemes. And if anybody wants more detail about the research, I've got you know I've got articles and powerpoints and things that I'd be quite happy to share. If anybody would like to know more about anything, that's fantastic. Thank you very much for your time today, Donna. I really, really appreciate it. And uh, plenty of things to think about after that episode. So uh, thank you once again. Well, thank you for having me. It's been a great chat and very good to meet you. Thank you. The Sociology Show podcast relies on the kind contributions of sponsorship and donations. If you enjoy the show, then you can help with the hosting costs by donating as little as £5 on the GoFundMe page. Simply visit uk.gofundme.com and search for The Sociology Show. If you can donate, then you will be sent a Sociology Show pen as a small thank you for your continued support of the show.